Good evening. We're ready to get started. Good evening and welcome to Insights from Foresight. On behalf of the entire Foresight team, I'd like to congratulate each of you on a job well done. Woo. The past 15 weeks have flown by, right? Time flies when you're having fun. It's hard to believe you've already reached the end of the semester. You've worked really hard, and we are very impressed with the quality of your reports, your presentations, your posters, and your videos. You should be very proud. You've shown remarkable diligence and have put forth tremendous effort. Please know that we appreciate your efforts and are very impressed with your results. I don't know how anyone could help but be tremendously impressed walking through the atrium today and seeing the culmination of an entire semester worth of work by so many Foresight teams. So you should be really proud. Um, we are very proud of you. Um, you know, we talk so much in Foresight language about being resilient. So we put some of our teams to the test today in my class and others. Um, what were your resilient plans as you stood up to give your Prezi presentation, only to find out that Prezi was, the website was down. So we um, have been through a lot together. It's been a great semester for me. This has been my first semester teaching, and I absolutely have loved the experience. So thank you to all of you for all the hard work. You should be really um, proud of yourselves. Um, we could not do this without a huge team effort. And on behalf of the entire Foresight team and all of our students, we would like to acknowledge and thank the um, help of our mentors. We've been um, aided in a huge way by teams of mentors from GE, IBM, and Chrysler. And we're really grateful to all of them for the support that they've given our student teams. Bill Chamberlain is here tonight with IBM. We want to thank you for being here. We really appreciate your willingness to be here and for the help that you and your team have given our students. So thank you. Let's thank them. <laughs> Ironically, I know that they're not here. Most of them are not in the room. But I also wanted to extend our huge gratitude um, to our TAs. The, the Foresight TAs have been in, in incredible support and have added an, an invaluable amount of help to each of us as instructors, so we appreciate their efforts. When you, I believe they're all out in the um, atrium helping to put everything away, but when you see your TAs, please acknowledge them and tell them thanks for the work that they've done. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Marty Curran serves as Executive Vice President and Innovation Officer with Corning Incorporated. Appointed as Corning's first innovation officer in August of 2012, he manages a portfolio of programs designed to increase the probability of success for new business opportunities. Corning's innovation office was created to build an entrepreneurial focused organization that could operate across all business segments to identify and develop near-term revenue opportunities. A key responsibility of the innovation office is to streamline the innovation process and to create faster product development and speed to market. Marty joined Corning in 1984 and has held a variety of roles in finance, manufacturing, and marketing. He's served as senior vice president and general manager from, for Corning Cable Systems Hardware and Equipment Operations in the Americas. He led the efforts to grow Corning's connectivity business, including the first major fiber to home offering with Verizon. He's also served as a senior vice president and general manager for Corning Optical Fiber and has served as chairman of US Connect, a Corning Connectivity joint venture. Mr. Curran graduated from the University of Notre Dame with a bachelor's degree in finance and received his master's degree from the University of Virginia's Darden Graduate School of Business. It's also my pleasure to introduce Marty to you this evening as a Foresight parent. Marty's daughter, Kara, is one of your classmates, a student in my, for cl my Foresight class this semester. Marty, welcome back to Notre Dame. Hey, thank you, Karen. Appreciate that, everybody. So when Dr. Miller told me that you guys were doing your poster sessions and that I was going to hold you up from going out afterwards on that, I said, I better go back and think about a couple of these things. And we have best practice practitioners of foresight in IBM. Corning would never dream to be that good. But I wanted to show you a little bit about what's behind the curtain. And I did ask our uh, video man tonight, the first two videos I'm going to show you 
or a little bit of foresight, think about what could happen here. And we haven't shown this uh, to anybody externally. That's why we have to erase it from the video. But I thought as students here, you might get a little kick out of that. So the first one that I'm going to show is a, a little product called uh, Gorilla Glass. Many of you have it on your mobile devices or your, or your uh, tablets. What's interesting about it is one of the tasks we have is where else can this be used? And uh, one of the guys came back and said, you know what? It might be pretty good in elevators. And uh, next time you're in an elevator, maybe you think about this because a very elegant and uh, easily decorated piece of glass can look good, but everybody says, but glass could break. So the guys put this together. And today I'll talk a little bit about how Corning thinks about uh, foresight and how what we would do that's a little bit different. So some of you have seen in the class the Day Made of Glass video. Hopefully that uh, you got uh, uh, a little bit of uh, ideas or imagination when you looked at it. There was a number of things shown there. Uh, and that itself was a little bit different in terms of innovation. Uh, it was actually uh, created by our chief financial officer. You know, not the scientists, not the marketing guys. And the reason he did it was because our chairman wanted to go out and tell people about his vision, and he kept cobbling together things from other people, and he said, you can't do that. You know, you're violating copyright. He goes, well, then give me something. And so our CFO went off, grabbed the cor corporate communications people, and he said to the scientists, I need you to give me something that could happen in the next decade. It could either be exist today or it could be in a lab today, but it can't be something that hasn't been developed yet. And so they put these together. And what was interesting to us was uh, we were going to use it only as a customer video. And it was a way for us to promote our vision. But it actually went out on, on YouTube and went viral. And what happened was it stimulated a lot of interest in conversations uh, whereby we end up having Day Made of Glass Days, Innovation Days, where we bring disparate thinkers from all different industries, uh, even the military as well, to come in and say, what, do you, what are the problems you're trying to solve, and how would a day made of glass be able to resolve that? And it significantly entry, increased our customer visits. So if you think about uh, what you're trying to do in your company, there's probably, uh, from our research center, two things that you want to remember. One is you're either working on platforms, that would be optical fiber, we'll mention in a minute, or, or uh, willow or gorilla glass. On the other side, you want to be working on applied research, which is, are there customer problems that I can solve using these things? Or are there customer problems that you could create, that you could not create, don't do that. The customer problems that you could solve by sending people to somebody in your ecosystem or your network, because if you help solve, then it always comes back around. The more people that you get to know, you'd be surprised at how references work today and how fast it happens. So in the meantime, from that Day Made of Glass video, we had a number of programs that emerged. Uh, antimicrobial surfaces, we had our first antimicrobial glass be sold is actually a Midwestern firm steel case. They put the glass, uh, Paul, on the conference center uh, conference rooms. You know, if you have to go in and reserve conference rooms, think about all the comp people that will touch that, and the idea is, huh, maybe that's where antimicrobial glass goes. We're looking at places like kiosks, operating rooms. What will it take to do that? And a lot of these are, you start with the idea and you, and you bring it out to them. Other ones, uh, like smart windows, that was this one that we did. This actually came as a, as a remembrance of uh, a deal we did. There's an electrochromic window. This is a 40-year-old technology. But there's a group in California named VIEW uh, Incorporated, and their idea is to take this out to the masses and make it, uh, run it in, in uh, like a semiconductor factory and be able to take electrochromic gla glass and windows out everywhere. And we're helping them with that. In addition to each of these, on the bottom right, one wireless, we believe that the whole world is going to have a fiber backbone and wireless drops. Everybody's going to be communicating in that fashion. And even one here, that if you wanted to see them later on, Gorilla Glass can be used for whiteboards. You know, what would happen if you had something that was as pure as glass but could be erased so nicely, unlike a porcelain boards today? Now, we realize being an interactive company that a lot of these things will be in interactive screens, but we were amazed to find out that glass 
is what sells in the top 2% of marker board markets. And we thought, okay, we'll get involved in that. So each of these things, when we put this video together, not only did it get uh, uh, your customers talking to you and beginning to think about what could happen in the future, what's happening today, what could happen you know, five years since, what would happen if these things happen and how does that all relate back to today? It also caused our own people to be able to create programs there. Now, there are challenges when we do this. You know, we don't know how to respond on a timely basis. I would say my experience in Corning has been that uh, oftentimes we don't kill projects. You know, the two things you have to do very well on a project is uh, you either take it across the finish line or you kill it. You know, the worst thing you could do is have a project that goes on forever and it does neither. So the one thing about, that we found is we kill the projects, we put them up on the shelf. You don't ever kill them. You write up, why did this not succeed? And put it up into the archives. And there's research reports that I've read going back into the 1950s uh, that people will pull out and read and try to get some ideas about where they're going. So how do you ferret out the opportunities that are here for today versus those before their time? And then how do you listen when you're talking to a customer? A lot of times when you go out there in the world and you're talking to someone, you're talking always about what you're trying to get across. And if I left you with one thing on that area, it would be please listen to the customer, what they're saying to you, because the opportunity for you is in the problem that they're trying to solve. There we go. So when we look at the current business environment, and you guys have seen this, the, the Schumpeter models, I'm glad that uh, that gets taught into class because uh, no, uh, Corning is uh, one of the companies that was in the S&P in 1958 and remains there today. There's not many of us left uh, right now, and we're even one of the more rare companies that dropped out during the downturn and then popped back on. Right? Usually when people go, they're gone. And it could be as a result of merger or acquisition or that the company actually fails. There's many, many uh, examples of that. But what's been very uh, disconcerting to see is that these rolling seven-year indexes, how long the life cycle is of a company that will stay on there now. And I think, you know, all around you are examples of companies that, you know, I mean, even those of you, is anybody in here carrying a BlackBerry? I mean, we used those Blackberries. They were really, really good. But, I mean, that was the, and that was, that's a short period of time, very short period of time. And so you have to think about things differently, and you really have to remain agile. If I gave you another thing, I think foresight is never 2020. So all you guys were out there, had the posters, excellent posters, by the way, a lot of energy, very, very interesting to see. But foresight is not 2020. So if you can have the combination of foresight, good tools to look at and imagine, and then put that with the ability to be agile and to attack, one way or the other, you will have to attack and defend or defend, and I'll explain that. That's where the magic comes. So I would say that there's corporate foresight to create and trade for the right assets or products. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about our research and development there's a good portion, about 85% of our products are the lowest cost in their area. So a portion of our research goes into ensuring that that happens. That's how you become and maintain your profitability. There's another chunk uh, where we cannibalize leading products. We will go out and make sure Gorilla will have a new uh, product. Uh, this year it's on Gorilla 4. And what you have to do, even though you're putting it out there, there's not additional revenues necessarily to be made other than the regular growth. What you're doing is making the product better so that you maintain your position. And there's a chunk of research that's dedicated to that. It sometimes feels like you're, you're on a treadmill trying to keep up on that. And then, the, then there's the piece that's the true research piece where you're going in and you're trying to find what you're going to be able to do. So managing all the above is the, is the little bit of a secret sauce. So today, we're about... We're, this year, we finished a, a, an acquisition of a Samsung joint venture that we had. At the end of last year, it will be about $10 billion, and uh, we now have over 4,000 employees uh, in Korea that we're able to add in there. And uh, we are leading glass ceramics and optical physics company and spent time with that. 
So that, it, what I would tell you then is when we look at what we do best is that we sustain our investment in research and development even when times got tough. We went as high as 10% uh, of, of uh, sales dollars. It's very important to be able to keep bringing the new ideas forward. And there's a lot of financial people, for those of you that will work on Wall Street, there's a lot of analysts that uh, at the quarterly report will ask you, you know, why are you spending that money in research and development? And there's other people that want you to predict when the new products are going to come out. And the best example that I got of predicting research, you know, a guy one day got frustrated with me because as a general manager, I wanted it today, today, today. And he said, you know, it's a little like fishing. You know, I might go out and I might not catch anything at all for the whole day. Or I might go out and the, the fish are biting and I'm going to be good all day long. The problem is I can't tell you what it's going to be like when I go out in that boat in the morning. Now, that's not entirely true, but that, that is, it is true that you're going to have to be patient if you're going to invest in research. And you have to have people with the right personalities. And I think part of why Corning took a business person and threw them into the research facility is to be able to have a little bit of that mix and match and to move things through a faster cycle. These are the market segments. Uh, the display glasses uh, are, are the, still the leading area, about a third of what we do. Uh, optical communications, and I'll talk about the, the, each of the events that uh, started each of these pieces on there. And then we're in the other products and services, the emerging innovations area. Some of the things we could talk about, some things we cannot, but one thing is for sure that Corning spends a lot of time trying to figure out two questions during their deep dive. We, we call our planning process the deep dive. And uh, our chairman, Wendell Weeks, says, make sure that you put this at the end of your pitch after you talk to me. Number one, how are you going to take out your competitor? What would you do if you had unlimited resources and had the ability to totally disrupt your industry? And then the second thing he asks is, now tell me how somebody else can come in and totally take you out. You know yourself better than anybody else in your industry. So come in and tell me how if you were on the other side of the fence, what you would do to take Corning out in that particular area. And those are very, very good exercises to go through in terms of knowing yourself and being able to try to predict what's going to happen. So we have a legacy of life-changing events. They started with uh, the light bulb on the, on the left there. That was really because Edison knew he had an envelope. He needed to make it in a, in a productive way. Many of your innovations, many of the foresight things that you had, I th there was at least three posters today that said, uh, when the cost comes down, this will become ubiquitous. And the only thing is, I would just want to remind everybody here when you go out there, the, the, that little phrase right there, when the cost goes down, there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes on in that in trying to get it down there. So you had, you had bulbs, and the, guy, the gaffers would blow the envelopes of the bulbs and place it on there, and you had a very nice light, light, uh, light bulb. But there's only a few people that could afford that. So Corning turned around, and they, they uh, invented a ribbon machine, sorry, invented a ribbon machine that allowed those light bulbs to be made for the masses. And uh, when we went and moved into Berlin uh, in the, uh, uh, after 2000, when we moved from Munich to Berlin for our uh, telecom European center, uh, in one of the factories close by, one of those ribbon machines were still running because that was what made the light bulbs from that point all the way up. Every light bulb was made in that fashion. Now, you, do you think somebody had foresight back then to think about, should they do that? No, what they knew was, if I get the cost down, I could sell a lot of light bulbs. You know, if I get the cost down, I could sell a lot of glass. And that's how they pulled it up. So let me tell you a little bit about the research center. If you're going to do any kind of foresight, you have to have some deep core technologies and, and capabilities. This is the magic, I think, in Corning of how we work. They're centrally located in upstate New York, which sounds odd if you're trying to think about a global company. 80% of our sales are outside the U.S. About a third of our people are inside the U.S. and we're centrally run. So we have uh, satellite research centers, but they all report back in, so we want to make sure that people are going through things. And the purpose of that is as you have 
uh, play, uh, things like modeling and simulation. I think I saw a couple of Russia posters tonight. We have a very good modeling and simulation group in Russia, in St. Petersburg. And one of the things you want to be able to do is, if you have a project, like something that we're doing for uh, tele to telephony down here, uh, that you're able to tap into world-class world modelers when you need them. So if you think about this, the, the, the uh, project manager may sit in here, the, pro the bulk of the project may be in one of these boxes, but then they'll pull people from where they need them when they need them. And I think that's a little bit of the secret sauce. And why is that important? Well, when they, when they looked at the, the innovations that happened in history from the light bulb, this was another interesting one. In the 1970s, as, as they had Earth Day, there was a, and the Environmental Act was passed, and cars had to stop spewing out smoke. If some of you folks see, you know, Beijing or Shanghai today and you look for the, the, the uh, cloud cover and everything, don't forget that L.A. looked like that back in the 70s. And what happened was the U.S. government said, no, you have to clean up the particulate. And what happened was one of our guys went down, believe it or not, to sell glass to one of the major car companies in Detroit. And they were unsuccessful. But they pulled out of their briefcase something different. And they said, you know, this could be a... A, a heat exchange unit. And they looked at that and they thought, yeah, you know what else? That probably could solve this problem here, which is my, our emissions. And that today, that technology today is used in the uh, catalytic converters around the world. And when the guy came back, the chairman at that time, Amo Houghton, he was able to go to that, that central research group and do a student body right, for all you football fans on there, Everybody's going to pull and make sure that this thing gets done from all the different places, and it worked. And we still do that today in a number of places. One of the areas that I'm, I'm personally interested, oh, let's see if I missed it. Yeah, here. Optical fiber took 17 years to commercialize. And, you know, when people get up there and they'll say that there's very patient money, you know, everybody knows this, patient money. You know, it's not very patient because every year they had a budget and every year they missed it. And every year they say, but next year it's going to happen, you know. And for 17 years after the invention, it didn't happen. And then when they finally had it, the guy that actually uh, threw open the whole switch was MCI back in the day when they wanted to build an entire network, and they were able to take this thing and build it. Now, the other part that happened was fiber for a long time was it's glass, and people treated it a very... Uh, uh, tenderly, and one of the one of the questions came up: What would happen if you could take that fiber and treat it like it was copper wire? You could bend it, treat it, push it, and do anything. Would that open up? What happens? And what they came back with and said was, you know what? I think that if you can do a lot of twists and turns, we focused at the time on Verizon's MDUs, the multi-dwelling units in New York City, because they have all these twists and turns and everything. But if they could do that, they could take care of fiber, and then it worked. So sometimes your foresight is born of taking a product that you have that you think could do a lot more, and you look out there and say, what would happen if? And play that game. There's plenty of tools out there to do that. And when you go into the new, where you, where you go to work, those of you that are seniors, you'll get plenty of opportunity to do the heavy lifting in that. The other thing that happened on the fiber to the home, in 1978, a, a PhD that worked for me, said, uh, uh, it worked for me eventually when we did there. I was still in school here in 1978. But he wrote a paper that said, fiber to the home is right around the corner. And it didn't happen until 2004. And that was another one where, you know, all your foresight tools, you, you say it's going to happen and here's why it should happen. And the truth is, you know, it's, it's like uh, Elon Musk's uh, electric cars. You know they're going to happen. You just don't know they're going to happen today, or are they going to happen 10 years from now or 20 years? But when this went out, this was a simple innovation here. It, we wanted to pre-wire the neighborhoods so that they could pass the homes, and then you only connect the consumers when they signed up for the service, and that was enough to be able to launch that innovation. I'd love to tell you that Corning had the foresight to figure that out back in 1978 when we wrote the first paper. We did not. We figured that out on the fly you know, when we thought that the, that the government regulation would change and allow this to happen. And as usual, what happens when you put value propositions in there, it's very difficult to sell a solution that costs more than the existing solution today. 
when you go out there and you tell people, if you spend a little more, the whole system works better. Somebody has to come along and, and, and take that leap of faith with you. And uh, when they do, then good things happen. Now, I, this, is, this is work from the inside. We did this for Sam, so uh, take my shot at this. Uh, we believe that, that the, co- the corporate insight starts with having deep competency in an area. It would be silly for us, although we could play the game, right? But it would be silly for us to try to have corporate insight uh, or, or, or do an exercise around an area that we have no, no deep knowledge in. Now, the question is, do you do that? Sure, we do that. We try to find areas that we're not playing in. We'll hire external consultants, and we'll try to become knowledgeable in an area, come to universities, frankly, too, to learn. But what, what really is valuable is when you have deep, deep insight and deep, deep knowledge in a particular area, and you can measure, you can team that up with technical competency. That market knowledge of that area and the deep technical knowledge allows you to sit at a table with anyone in the world and have a discussion about how that would go. When somebody wanted a discussion about optical physics and how far optical fiber could go in the network, we could, our, our, our scientists could sit with anybody in the world on that. And I think that that's one of the secrets. When you go out and you look at your company, a lot of companies have difficulty picking what are the things that they have their deep knowledge in, and then what are the, what are the, the uh, deep market and what are the deep technical competencies that you can bring to it. It doesn't mean if you don't have it that all is lost. It means that if you don't have it as a corporate foresight exercise, you should go out and get it, whether it be with a university, consultant, or hires, or a partnership or joint venture with somebody who has that knowledge. Now, here's another way to look at it. Uh, we thought about this for a bit. You know, there's sources of insight, and then there's sources of imagination. And it is true that uh, a lot of times when we're looking for imagination, we tend to go to the same folks over and over again. And uh, a lot of times, I, you know, there's, there's, there's one school of thought that says everybody has an imaginative thought, and you know that that's true. But it is also true that some people are prolific at being imaginative. And if you find that person or persons, what you try to do is to bring them in as many things as possible so that you get it out there. We have folks, actually, like, like I mean, we have corporate fellows, and some of these guys are, uh, we wouldn't say crazy, but we would say that they can think outside the box better than anyone you know. And what's fascinating, the one that I like the best, uh, these Delta teams, I put them up there first because they're my favorite. A Delta team is formed when you have an end condition that you want to get to that does not exist today. So I may have a facility, a factory, that makes X. And my question may be to the, I, I happen to be an old finance guy, so I'm, I apologize that a lot of my things are based on cost and trying to make profit, but that's kind of the way I think about it. I may put a Delta team on the question, how can you make that factory with the same machines and same people, same number of machines, they could be different machines, put out five times as much as what they do today. Under what conditions could that happen? And then turn them loose. Another thing they could do is, uh, and these, these were actual exercises that were done, looking out at the state of the world in optical fiber for the next 10 years, think about what the areas are that you think could grow. So there's a lot of growth because of all of the, the, uh, the absolute wiring and big data for everything. But it's also true that for optical fiber, there's a lot of uh, trade wars going on, right? A lot of barriers to where you go play. And so one of the questions may be, how can you make a factory that's very mobile, that can move, that can do something in one place and then quickly move to another? Another one is the energy uh, uh, areas today. We have this ability to clean up particulate. So if there are all these wells being opened up, is there an ability or a chance to have a mobile uh, 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 unit that can go and crack that gas? And then when that well is done, be able to take it up and roll it over to the next well and go. We have these advanced flow reactors that are, you know, one twentieth the size of a regular chemical plant. 
And that was a new new that we threw out there. And then when we started looking at this, we were starting to find very, very interesting things. If you throw the Delta teams together with very imaginative people, it's really uh, a, a, an amazing thing that could happen. I would tell you two things. One, because you're using very, very uh, good talent, they're very sharp knives. You want to use them thoughtfully and carefully, so pick a big problem to solve. And then the second thing is define the problem very, very carefully. Otherwise, they'll boil the ocean and you won't get anything out of that. But in each of these pieces, when we have, we have the sources of insight, when you look at all this thing, we spend a lot of time uh, inside and outside searching for the trends. Everybody has mega trends. Those are the, I call those the waves that you surf on. Those are going to happen regardless of what you do. So now you, you're, you and your company are the surfer on that wave, and you have to figure out what is it that you're going to be able to get from that particular wave. And using those tools, the corporate foresight tools, to be able to think about that, it's very, very important. And I think these sources of imagination, um, I, I, because of this job, I'm a year and a half into it, I said I would take two years to try to launch a couple of new product groups, and I don't want to be, I don't want to do, you know, talks like this, because it takes time out of the day to go do. But I said, you know what, if you don't do talks like this and you don't get out and you don't talk to people, there's at least three ideas I got just from walking through your poster sessions. You have to get out and network and do that. You can't always keep your head down and go. Okay. So look for the imagination and look for the sources of insight. Now, there's the other part. We call that, that part where you're looking out there the, the foresight to explore and exploit. So you want to look, and then you want to get a business, create a business, because that's how you're all going to put food on the table. And then the other part is the foresight to defend. And that means, how's the other guy going to eat your lunch? On exploring, we spend a lot of time, I'll explain this Magellan process and the technology exchange and these product line updates, but that's where we're going out and looking for things. Okay? And when we do that, we have a Magellan process that we actually go and look at the megatrends, this is something that is vetted through all of the folks uh, in, a, in the research center in Corning. They bring together the, what, they, what they believe the ideation things are in, and then from that we'll select. This year I asked the CTO to take personal responsibility for what areas we were going to go in, because I think it's that important. I think you have to be the people at the top have to pick what you're going to do. Then we do a very short burst white paper, no different than some of the projects that you would do here. And from the short burst you decide is there something here that needs to get more in-depth analysis? CTC is, called, is the Corporate Technology Center. That's the equivalent of our sort of venture uh, uh, exercise. A research person feels like they have something they want to get money invested in. They have to bring it before the board and present why we should invest in that area. And that comes down. You can imagine each of these filtering down to that. And then you get your stage one projects. And I talked here before in a classroom about... Uh, agile process. Uh, the only thing I would tell you on that is there's a five-stage process towards most, uh, many companies use this to be able to uh, develop their products. But what we tell you is that there's a good way to be agile and, and you end up combining or, or doing simultaneously the first three stages. And what you're trying to do is get to a crystallizing customer who can tell you whether you have a good idea or not. Because too many projects remain in a lab with people working on it because they have the build it and they will come mentality. You're, you're far better off if you have somebody pulling you than if you have a technology push. There you go. So we do look at a number of variables. We, we end up spending time with the mega trends and looking at the industry drivers. This is the one that I wanted you to take away. Look for industry disruptions by others that will take you out and look for disruptions by Corning. Every day you read the paper, it's amazing. Just when you thought you've seen it all, something new will happen on there. And there are radical things happening, they're happening faster and faster. And if you pay attention, not only that, personally, because you all are business students and analysts and everything, you ought to do very well because you have insight to what's going on out there. And by the way, this is different than launching an innovation. When we launch an innovation in some of the programs that I run, while we have to pay, put a little bit of time and effort into what monies will be required for the year, we run those programs on 90-day plans. The way people have to think about it is their program has 90 days to get up and running and going. 
here's the milestones I hit. And then if you hit the milestones in those 90 days and it looks positive, then you go renew for another 90 days. And that, that keeps the focus and the pressure on making sure that you're getting out there and bringing it to the customer. Now, the foresight to defend, just to spend a little time on that, uh, there's a lot of things in a lot of areas to look at in there, the market assessment and competitors. One area you need to look at is in IP. We spend time with where is the intellectual property being generated. Um, it's fascinating to see what countries are filing, what areas they're filing in, what industries are filing, why are they filing. One of the things I loved when I was in optical fiber, after that industry uh, collapsed, almost all the R&D efforts were put on the, on the ground. We had trouble in 2001 and 2 when the dot-com bubble collapsed. Corning lost half of their revenues and half of our people. It was a very, very, very difficult time. And uh, many of us had the scars on our back to prove it. So our job was don't let it happen again. And when 2008 came along and the financial crisis came, you, you know a lot of companies were doing a lot of spinning of what could happen, what does this mean. A lot of our spinning was to take care of ourselves, and I'll show you our, our rings of defense, but we also went on the attack. Our, our assessment was so many people would be withdrawing and hunkering down and getting into the trenches that that was the very time, if you had a good balance sheet, and we did, that you should move forward and go into it. We got caught once, we would not get caught the second time. Right? So I'll tell you a little bit about on the defend part here. These strategy updates are all interesting, but the truth is when somebody whacks you up in the head, how you respond to that, you don't know until it actually happens. So uh, one of our, our uh, uh, at the time, one of the management committee folks came up with this rings of defense, and I thought it was fascinating, and uh, I still operate with this today, and that is, Tell me if everything went to hell, like in your, in your posters out there, you have the one condition where nothing goes right. Show me the condition where everything goes wrong, what you would do, what your rings of defense are to be able to take care of your people. Because your people are your most important asset. That's where the imagination's coming from. That's where you're going to have to be the resilience to get back and grow. And how are you going to do that? And so we spent a lot of time on this, and it was fascinating to watch when... when uh, when you grow your business, a good way, good for those of you out there that are good financial managers, you watch the incrementals. Your sales and your profit, right, for, the, for each sales dollar that you grow, your profitability should be higher than your natural business, meaning your incrementals should be better as you go up. What happens when people go down is that they hold on for too long thinking it will come back, and your incrementals become almost 100% meaning you lose a dollar of sales and you're losing a dollar of profit. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. And so we play the game, what can you do? And it's a very difficult thing. So if you do get into business and you have to uh, look at the rings of defense, look at those incrementals up and down. And we've practiced this ever since, and it's, it's done very well for us. Now, in closing, I just want to say that I think that the foresight is the combination of insight and imagination Foresight is not 2020, so if you could combine the foresight tools with a little bit of agility, then I think that's an unbeatable combination. Uh, we've succeeded for, we're 163 years old. We had a near-death experience multiple times. We do not want to be one of the companies that falls off of the list because we were not practicing foresight, and, and in the way that we explained it, and with the foresight to explore and exploit, but also the foresight to defend. And so I think as you go out into the world and you look for companies that are doing that, look for people that think that way, are global, and have that ability to do it. I also believe that successive waves of innovation, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen with this beautiful decorated backsplash. You know, is this going to put a lot of tile guys into a different world, or is this going to be just another crazy idea that somebody had that, that may or may not worked out? What I do know is that if the waves of innovation come and they're using platforms that you've developed, then it's very, very inexpensive, relatively inexpensive to continue to go on. And uh, where we're different than we were in 2001, we became very, very good manufacturers. I think in this world, you have to be a very good manufacturer because the low-cost guy does not go out of business. So remember that, too, when you go out there. And in the meantime, 
Remember, uh, Karen was telling me a little bit about the, the feedback from the class today. You guys have to remember the tools you're being taught here, people are going to uh, uh, want you to be able to use them in the businesses that you go to and be able to actually apply it to a real problem. And when you have the actual insight that we call it the fog of war, many times when things are going badly and everybody's getting upset, you don't really step back and say, what's really happening here? and make the right moves like a general would on a battlefield. And what we're trying to do as you're here in school is to train you to be able to do that and not, not wait 30 years like somebody like me to get the experience to then finally figure it out. So with that, we'd like to thank you. And if there's any questions or answers on anything about corning or if there's foresight questions, I'm going to give them to Professor Miller here. Right? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Anybody have any worries or questions or anything? So one of the things that we worry about when we're out there today is what will the next billion dollar business be for Corning? Because when Gorilla came, we had no clue. You know, what, the way they talk about it in the Isaacson book, I mean, that's exactly how it happened. You got a piece of plastic, you got glass that's 10 times the cost. Why would anybody use that? You actually need it to be scratch resistant. And since then, everybody wants it to be break resistant, too. So we'll spend time on that. Any questions? Well, I feel good about this, then. That means I answered everything on there. Um, There's always thanks. one, right? <laughs> everybody wants to go out and get a beer. No, I'm teasing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, first, thank you for coming. and. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that it's better to be pulled by consumers than pushed by technology. Uh, um, how do, where do you find those consumers to really push you, and where do you find those opinions? Yeah, very good question. So to be clear, because my CTO, Dr. David Morris, would be very upset if I said we don't do any technology push. What I would say is his, his big belief is you create the platform, optical fiber, ceramic substrates, LCD glass, Gorilla glass, uh, Willow glass, create the platform. Once you have that, our belief is that a customer should be looking for an immediate problem that they have to solve. You know, think about the backsplash guy. He was struggling you know, in the homes and spending a ton of money, and, and there were very dissatisfied consumers. And now you saw how he's able to zoop, zoop, and now he's going to take this thing and go. We listened, and we solved it. Where do you find them? There's a little bit of foresight to that. You have to do, use your imagination. Where do you go? So when they found this guy, and it was, it was totally by going to shows, reading websites. That's where we found out on Amazon.com that this marker board here, the glass marker boards, first of all, that are so doggone expensive, do you know that the larger they get, the more expensive per square foot they get? Usually, that, it, you would think it'd go the other way around. And they're very heavy and no one can handle them. You know, I could even hold up one you know, this big on this thing and it'd be that easy. So what you have to do is you have a little imagination, you find that one piece, and then you begin to pull the thread. So another example, the, there's the mega trend in automobiles is that they have to get lightweight. You saw Ford goes to aluminum. You saw BMW use carbon fiber. Both of those are more expensive than what they're using today, but they have to get to lightweight for emissions. So we thought to ourselves, doesn't it make sense that you can make the windows thinner and more lightweight, and shouldn't we put Gorilla Glass into automobiles? And so a lot of that is you come in and it, <laughs> there, you, you get the ideas from, we have a guy who's uh, 90 years old. He's the father of the fusion process for Corning. And I walked into the, David's office and he's saying, listen, you young man, you know, you ought to be doing more of this or that. And I, had, I said, who is this guy? Oh, he's the father of fusion. Oh, okay. At 90 years old in Corning, you're allowed to go back in. You have a blue badge and a corporate fellow works as long as they want forever. He's still working on new applications for fusion glass. So do you think we listen to him? Oh, yeah, we do. And he's, he's on the net every day thinking, you know, you could use it over here. You could use it over there. The only thing I would tell you is that everybody has a lot of ideas. It's very, very, it's, it's easier to have an idea than it is to actually develop that idea all the way to and sell something. It's very heavy lifting. And what we say is, in every project, there's a big lie. Most times the big lie is people won't pay as much as you want. The value's not there. 
or your costs are too high. But your job is to find that big lie faster than anybody else. You, know? you just get out and network. So by the way, everybody here, I don't care if you don't know everybody in your class, in your school, please, get, you should be connected, you know, whether, whether it is on LinkedIn or whatever social network you're going to use, because it starts with the class that you graduated with and the friends that you had in making the connections and go. I didn't, of course, we didn't have, you know, back in my day, we didn't have all this, the tools that you have today, but I'm amazed. I actually do more with my Darden, Virginia people in trying to find contacts and connect with people then, and it's so much easier today. So I would tell you that as you guys come out, finding those customers with the problems is actually going to be easier. The hard part is going to be taking the pieces that you want and solve that problem. So given the varying risk profiles that come along with new projects, how do you guys think through the resource allocation um, and kind of how much to go into each project and at what specific times? Yeah, I had a board of director, uh, one of our board of directors tell me last night, he goes, you have a habit of going all the way out to the edge and then pulling back. And so what I would tell you is everybody's personality for risk is a little different. And when you try to find the resources for something, you have to prioritize. Everybody hates to prioritize. Uh, in our company, it's turned out to be a very natural thing. Uh, of the money that we spend on the programs that I'm running on there, three programs take 70% of the spend. So it does happen naturally. Now, I'm already over my budget for the year. A guy came in with a great idea. It's a really good idea. It has to do with the willow glass. So I have two choices. I could be a bureaucrat and say I have no money and not do it, or I could go beg forgiveness and go do it and find out if I have something. And to the gentleman before, what I do is I'm going to have a customer who's ready to buy the product and then take it in and then do the spend, right? So in all your life, uh, you know, the network inside of a company and, and your credibility will come to pass. Uh, that that becomes very, very important in terms of what you bring. Because when you bring it, it needs to be one that you're, if you're going to break the rule and break the budget, bring something that's going to go win or has a high probability of winning. Because, you know, a really good batting average in innovation is one out of five. Okay? And, and I'm not talking from the ideation, carrying that thing across the finish line. What, what my job is, is to try to get every project that we formally start and spend money on to get more like one out of two. Okay, and that's, what, that's the way you have to look at that. Right. You will prioritize. You, everybody does. In the end, when somebody's yelling at me, I want more money. So, you know, what do you do at home when you don't have any more money? You know? They say, well, I go to my credit card. I say, okay, well, then let's go talk to the boss. Who is the customer you're going to sell to? What are you going to do? And if they have the business case all set up, then I will take them in. Right? I don't know. It's worked for me for almost 30 years. I'm going to keep doing it that way until I retire. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? All right. We can let them go. All right. Be, oh, sorry. I'll repeat it for you if you want. Thank you. Uh, so I think that the idea of this Gorilla Glass is really pretty innovative, and we watched a pretty cool video about, I guess, everything being made out of glass. And so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about product development and actually taking a product like that to market. And after hearing that it's very cost-sensitive, pretty expensive, um, when you think a product like this will actually become integrated into our generation? And what it will do, okay. I'll give you two pieces that I can think of. I asked a guy, actually Karen knows this guy, Will Shermer. <laughs> when he was making the clear curve fiber, I said, Will, I know what I'm going to sell it for. You've got to tell me what the cost is. And, and after about the sixth day of me asking him in a row, he went up and he went, that's how much it's going to cost. And then, and then walked away. I am still to this day don't know what the heck he was talking about. I think he was a horse doing that. The problem is you could have projections on what you think will happen uh, and the cost as well as the price. But the, but the truth is there's twists and turns along the way. And so as you're, as you're going through, the areas that you have deep competency in and deep knowledge, man, we nail it. In an area, we may have a new coating, we may have a new material, and we're learning about it and you have to learn, you have to go through the experience curve of the deep knowledge. 
it's a little different and a little harder. Uh, so that's the first part. The part is where you have the deep knowledge, you tend to make better decisions. I had a guy, a corporate fellow. There's a woman who did a very good uh, decision tree about a glass that she had to solve for people, and she had maybe 28 different glasses. Now, you've got to understand, to do those, she would have to spend 5 to $10 million on each, each one to try them out. Hey, no, we don't have any money. So I had the corporate fellow come over, Sharp Tool, and I had him go talk to the customer, and I had him come back. It, it burned a week of his time. Wendell actually came to me and said, did you really use a week of his time? I said, yeah, because I think it's important. And he came back and said, of the 28, here's the three that could work. And by the way, to this day, he, he has some science in it, but some of it is in the gut and his experience, and one out of the three worked. And he nailed it. So you, that, that insight really matters on there. Now, the part about that you're asking, here's what I learned. If I had known this, I don't know if I would have taken this job. When we did the Verizon Fiber to the Home, I, I, I owned all the factors of production. We had manufacturing, technology, and commercial. You know, that, those were all my guys. I knew the customer of Verizon. So when they came and they said they had a problem and they needed it, then I did a student body right. We moved, I moved at the time 80% of our engineers to work on this. They were mine. What happens today? Gorilla Glass for auto. So we have this beautiful invention. It's an invention. It's not an innovation until you sell something. Always remember that. So we had an invention. But when you go out there, there's an auto glazing business, right? They're full capacity. They make windows. It's one of the oldest industries, okay? And so in the old days, Corning probably would have gone out and bought, you know, one of those companies to begin selling. But in the, to be nimble, you should be able to convince these guys this is a good idea, and then you could sell into there. And then I can't, on the same time, I don't know the customer. While we sell catalytic converter material substrates to auto OEMs, we do, that's a different part of GM and Ford and those guys. So we have to go to a completely different customer. So I have an invention. Great idea. It's a great idea. I don't understand why everybody's not using it. But I have to now go out to a customer, I mean, a, a manufacturing base that really doesn't want me to come in and destroy what they're doing and because it, it's very disruptive and an, an OEM that kind of wants it. So I use the OEM comes in, we go there and they bang on these guys and then these guys come back and say, hey, what are you doing? You know, and you have to manage those things. So a lot of times, uh, this, will, this will give you my age, but when, when we were coming out of school, we had to choose between buying the Betamax or the VHS. That's a wonderful story. And I always remember going to, at the time, Circuit City, another example of people that don't survive. And we went in and the guy said, listen, you're going to make the right choice because this Betamax, when you looked at it, it held, more, it held more show. It was a lot smaller. It was more elegant. It didn't win. So um, uh, many, many good ideas die on the vine and have to come back later on. And, you know, some of what we do is to pick the ideas that were, bef that were before their time and try to bring them in. So many times you, it is a little like catching lightning in a bottle. It's a little more systematic than that. But there's a lot more that are tried that you don't see by a lot of companies than there are that actually make it. And the only thing you can do is, we do a lot of time, we do two things. What did we do to make the successful things? And then what do we do when we dig ourselves into a hole? You know, we find ourselves sometime in a hole, man, and we're still digging. And we're the first thing is, stop! <laughs> Throw the shovel out of the hole, you know? Stop that, okay? How do we get back out of the hole? We're really good at getting back out of holes. But one of the things we're trying to figure out is how the heck did we get in there in the first place? And most times, it's because we didn't apply the right insight to the problem, right? This is too long of an answer for that. For every good thing that you see, there's many, many more that die in the vine, and many of the ones that die in the vine are great ideas. Great ideas. Anybody else? All right, they're going. So we're going to let everybody go and get your beers. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank